All right, let's just give this 15 or so seconds so we can start filling up as I stare at Matt Moore and Justin Fan and Worldwide Wob. Hold on one second here. I'll share this. Smash away. All right. This is it. Post Last Dance show from the Action Network. I am Chad Millman, along with Matt Moore, Justin Fan, Worldwide Wob. Two fantastic shows, episodes five and six. Let's go around the horn. I, I will say, I didn't love episode five. I actually thought it was kind of boring. And I need some perspective here because is it boring because I'm a Jordan super fan who grew up in Chicago and felt like all of this was retreading old ground? Was it boring to me because episode six was so good and so inside and so gambling centric, which we're going to get to? Wob, you first. Episode well, five. Well, my question back to you is why did you find it boring? Is because it was stuff you already knew? Yeah. Just felt like it's exactly what it felt like. Okay. So yeah, it was a lot of retracing steps. And I think not every single person watching this documentary was alive, one for it, two knowledgeable of it in the first place, even if you were alive. And then there's the big group of kids that are watching this that were born after the year 1995 that probably didn't even know any of this stuff existed. So I think that's more of a focus on a very specific demographic of fan. It's not right or wrong. But yes, I will agree with you that they went over a lot of stuff. And the reason that they're doing that is they're trying to tell three different stories. Jason Ayer told us this on an interview here on the Action Network, that they're trying to tell th three different avenues to this or part of the plot. The first of which is the origins of the key players, the Rodmans, the Pippins, the Jordans, how they grew up, where they came from, their experiences through college, uh, who makes what makes them those people today. Then they want to tell the story of the Bulls dynasty, which technically started in 1984 when they drafted Michael Jordan all the way up to the 1997 season. So they want to cover all of the events that led up to the last dance, which is the third avenue, 1997, 1998, the actual season of the end of the dynasty. Right. And I, there's a lust for like all of this behind the scenes footage that needed mutual approvals for where is it? Well, I want more of it. I've already seen the Monte Carlo game. I've already seen the dream team stuff. Totally get it. But I, I preach patience to you because it's all leading up to that final two episodes when it's just the last dance. They're doing that for a reason because they're setting you up for what is ultimately going to be a climax of stuff that we haven't seen yet in episodes nine and 10. My personal opinion, I'll kick it to either Matt or Justin for that, but I think it's more of a storytelling choice versus a uh, educational piece per se. Justin, you go. Justin's on mute. So somebody now Justin's on, now Justin's on mute. <laughs> oh, I got that. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I agree with Wob. I think a lot of the stuff that what was was gone over in the as as in respect to the Dream Team is covering the Dream Team documentary. That's a documentary I've watched probably ten times, twenty times already. Um, but I think we got some really good moments in episode five. The stuff with Kobe at the beginning was was really great. Um, the background on the shoe deals, uh, Adidas taking probably emerging from this whole thing as the taking the biggest L of all, um, saying that they couldn't make a. Shoe and um, I, there's some details on the Kukoc thing uh, from his perspective that we didn't get in the Dream Team documentary about him like having no idea about the, the bad blood between Kraus and, and, and Pippen and Jordan coming in. He thought they were, he was like meeting his new teammates. It's like the first day of school. It's like trying to, his, his first impression with his new friends, his new teammates. And he just gets absolutely torched and destroyed. And I think it's a cool story, you know, with Kukoc going from that bouncing back in the in the finals game, having a good game, and then going on to do what he did with the Bulls. I, th I thought that was a that was a cool arc. But I, you know, I agree with you. A lot of it was kind of, you know, gone over and 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 retread. But um, I, I agree with Bob, it's necessary to kind of lay that 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 foundation. And before Matt goes, 
uh, the first five minutes of episode five. Are you kidding me with the locker room stuff? You had the entire Eastern Conference All-Star team telling stories about Kobe Bryant, who's only been in the league for a year and a half. Where else are we going to see that type of footage? That was at the 1998 All-Star game. So that that alone made episode five worth it, for me at least, hearing Tim Hardaway and Rick Smith tell us where else can you hear that kind of stuff, Matt? Yeah, I really enjoyed the Tim Hardaway and Rick Smith drop-ins. Those were those were enjoyable. Um, I think part of my thing is, you know, they're they're building a story and they're building a narrative. I think part of it is it's a 10-part doc. And so we kind of want to go on more of a journey. And it feels like so much of this has been laying the groundwork. And we're now six episodes in. And I think that that's part of it is the issue is like, I, I get it. He hated Jerry Krause and Jerry Krause was bad and Jerry Krause was an idiot and let's all dance on Jerry Krause and not mention the fact that he died. The man's dead. Um, would like that mentioned at some point in the conversation. Uh, but like the whole thing with Ku coach, I, I, because again, this is all kind of told from Jordan's perspective. It kind of just like rushes through that of like, look how competitive and fierce they were. They tore Tony apart just because Krause liked him. Krause sucks. Reminder, Kraus sucks, and that's why they did this thing. When it's like, wait, so this guy's going to be your teammate, and he didn't do anything to you? All he did, as somebody on Twitter commented, he just got up out of bed in the morning, and you ripped him to pieces? Like, when you start to look at that, you're like, oh, this is, like, part of what he was talking about when he said he was worried about how he would come off. Episode 7 next week is apparently, like, the one where a lot of stuff comes out about, you know, his competitiveness and fierceness and outright ruthlessness. And I see Wob nodding. So like, I can assume that that, that will be the payoff there. Um, I thought that the Kobe stuff was cool, but it felt, I, I would say that five felt very scattered to me. Like it just kind of bounced around. It's like, Oh, it's a little bit about Kobe, but it's also, but then like, no, it's about the all-star. And then like, we're just going to like dip in through the Knicks series, but not really. And then, we're going to go to the, to, uh, to the dream team and that decision, but we're going to brush past that really quickly. And it's mostly just about like uh, Tony Kukoc, because again, screw Jerry Krause. Like it felt very scattered. The stuff with him competing in the locker rooms was good. Um, I thought six, like six was awesome. Like I thought six was great. I think, I think six goes down as, as one of the best episodes so far, but I would agree with Chad that I felt like five, it felt a little more scattered than usual. Like I've been able to handle the t time sequence going back and forth because they're following a lot of what Halberstam did in his book playing for keeps. And so it doesn't, it makes sense to me from that perspective. Um, but this one felt really kind of scattered and I I'm not, I guess part of it is like they wanted to focus on the 98 run, which I get, but they're laying all this groundwork, but it's also like, I think a lot of us want more of like a real documentary just on the, the total path and more stuff talked about in detail rather than like hey here's like four minutes on the Knicks rivalry up oh, we're out again um and that that to me is I think why five felt a little scattered talking about the Knicks rivalry that was so intense so passionate so physical so angry like it was a visceral emotional experience for NBA fans, whether you like the Knicks or you like the Bulls, like that was something where everything shut down. And I, I had moved to New York at that point. I just moved to New York when that series was happening. The city was empty when those games were happening. And that to me, I'm, I was trying to think about when I was watching that part of the show, is there an NBA rivalry that exists today that has the same ferocity. And I don't even know if you can do that because the game can't be as physical. Like there's nothing about Warriors Cavs for the past few years that had the same feeling as anything that the Knicks and the Bulls were going through with John Starks and Anthony Mason and Charles Oakley. Like those were bloodbaths. Wob, as the resident passionate Knicks lover who has not been, who like you were barely alive when this was going on. You haven't had that great experience. I was very much alive for, for that playoff series. That is the epitome of my childhood and why I have so many gray hairs at this very young age that I currently am. Okay, Chad? But uh, the difference that you're looking for is it was a different era in many aspects. The first of which is there was no social media. 
there was no of these all these extra opportunities that you get in the world today by being an NBA basketball player. Everything was your performance on the court. Rings, that's this is where rings culture started from because you got a big contract if you won. And there was, unless you were like Mike with Gatorade or you got your own shoe from Converse, Adidas, or Nike, many of these players didn't have the opportunities that they do today where you get $500,000 for an Instagram post or to talk at some conference. So what mattered was on the court, and that's why Patrick Ewing was saying if there was no blood, there was no foul. The game was officiated differently. It was a different set of rules, literally and figuratively. So I would attribute all of those as to why the 90s style was played that way. And you talk about the Cavs versus the Warriors now. They have so many business interests together. Steph Curry and LeBron James are probably indirectly invested in 15 of the same companies that they don't even know that they're invested in together. You have business interests. You have friendships. You have emotional ties which affect business. And also there's so many more dollars out there because the BRI, the uh, basketball-related income, sorry, Basketball related income has extrapolated since the mid 90s. So you have players making a lot more money with a lot more at risk. And it's in my best business interest to be best friends with all of my competitors because rings aren't all that matters anymore. I think that's just a fact, Matt. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think they were allowed to hate each other, I think, a little bit more because, like, there was a big drive to kind of like reassert the friendliness as time went on. Like, there's been movements. Um, and then that's, that's a, that is on part due to the players union. I think that you can see a direct connection between the players union, like AAU and the players union and the two things that I would probably link to those kind of changes. And just like a recognition of some of the regrets that the older players have of like, I spent years hating this guy and like, we were great. And I wish that we did. I, I wish I hadn't held that in my heart as long, but I don't think Jordan feels that way. I think Jordan pretty clearly from the Isaiah Thomas stuff is, is cool with just being like, Nope, I still feel this way. This is how I'll, I'll always feel. Um, interesting kind of thing you, for talk about how close and how good that Knicks team was. So the Knicks were, I looked this up on sports odds history. The Knicks were plus plus one fifty to win that series. Uh, the Suns were plus plus one ninety. So the Knicks were a shorter dog to the bulls than Barkley's 93 Suns were like, that's an incredible Testament to how good that Knicks team was. Knicks um, were a better team, man. Yeah. We're and, a better team that year. If Charles Smith finishes one layup there. Great job by Pippen. They finished one layup. History is told a lot differently. I'm sorry. They're the better team that season. Bulls are a better franchise, better dynasty throughout the decade. That year, that season, that New York Knicks team was the biggest problem in the league. And the Bulls, time after time, continually, that's the the epitome of a great team, is getting over games that you're not supposed to win. And they pulled it off. They were not better that season. But even that Charles Smith play, Justin, that Charles Smith play, like – that game gets called differently today. That right. Charles Smith play, that first attempt at the at a putback, he someone gets called for a foul. Pippen gets called for a foul. Jordan gets called for a foul when he's stealing the ball underneath the basket. Like at some point, that play doesn't happen because Charles Smith goes to the free throw line. He one hundred percent got fouled on the play. I mean, no question. I mean, at least once, if not twice. So yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. And yeah, the physicality and just the rivalries between the players is something we don't see to this day. Like even going back to the bad boys with, with Jordan and Isaiah Thomas, like the resentment is still bubbling to this day. Um, we've seen, we saw in, in, in previous parts, we don't, we don't see those kind of, you know, deep seated hatreds and, and rivalries and, and uh, resentments uh, between players nowadays. This was one thing that I took away from that episode that I had completely forgotten about. Actually, this part, I didn't know. I remember the book, the Jordan rules really well. Horace Grant getting laid out as a guy who was giving away so much stuff to Sam Smith, I had never heard that. And the fact that players were just coming right out, this is what's so much fun about this documentary right now, is nobody is afraid, it's 20 years later, nobody is afraid to say anything. They are holding nothing back. And then um, to go to Horace Grant and be like, no, I'm not saying it, I didn't say anything, is fantastic. So there's a couple of things here. There's a couple of things here. First is that, um, this is kind of an issue with the documentary with Jordan having final say over the archival footage. And we've, we've hit on this in the past where he can kind of frame certain situations, certain things in the way he wants with his perspective, right. With, with the whole Isaiah Thomas thing, with his relationship with Doug Collins, um, with Horace Grant's role in this, like he can put his spin in and has say on how things are portrayed. Um, and we see that here. And another thing I want to touch on is Jordan, 
we've seen this repeatedly where the um, traveling cocaine circus, he's talking about how his, his, those players were drinking beer and smoking cigarettes, cigarettes that they got from the coaches at halftime of the, uh, during those games. Like he's just, so we got the Scott Burrell thing on the plane um, last episode. Like he's just snitching on everybody, uh, you know, in this documentary. It's crazy. Go ahead, Matt. You were going to say something. Yeah. So I, I'm just livid about how Horace Grant got treated in this doc. Like just livid over it because like he's not a Hall of Famer. I think he has a pretty good case. He was integral to that first three, Pete. He was awesome. He did all of the dirty work. He was a phenomenal passer. I did a a post a couple of years ago about players that would have benefited the most from playing in the modern era. Horace Grant as a stretch five would destroy worlds now. Like he would be incredible in today's game. Um, Really underrated. The the Paxson shot, great rotation by Horace Grant to make that pass. Like just absolutely, he was awesome. And like you mentioned, like 20 years, like Horace Grant is not the type of guy that would be like, that would continue to lie. Like if he, if he had leaked it, he'd be like, yeah, I leaked it. I was mad. Like that's, I was definitely mad at him. He's got no reason not to. So like, I believe him when he says that I didn't, I didn't leak. like any good reporter is going to have a whole lot of people to be able to inform him. And Sam Smith is a legend in the business for him to be able to get the information that he got on the Jordan rules. Like one of the things that was interesting in these two episodes was like, he t- J- Justin talked about the framing the going into the gambling stuff. Like Jordan tries to make it as in like, Oh, the media just like twisted everything. And like, there was never, he, he continues to be like, well, there was never really any, any sort of problem, which I, I eventually came to that conclusion. The article I wrote that kind of detailed all the stories. He didn't have a problem because it's impossible for him to ever gamble enough for him to have a problem. But like the man's gambling was compulsive. There's no doubt about that. And it was definitely like an impact. He would just manage to always rise above it. And the way that he was able to like, he's just, the whole doc is like, you're just, it's a continuation of his hall of fame speech and that he's still listing enemies. He's still making everybody into that coach that cut him from varsity. Like He's still making everybody into that Horace Grant, Tony Kukos, Jerry Krause, Isaiah Thomas down, down the list. Like he's just going down the list of everybody. And the media gets like slipped into that category as well in these episodes as another person that tried to tear him down, which I find a little hilarious because I don't think there's any athlete that's been covered more positively throughout his time than Michael Jordan. I just want to jump in here real quick. I think his hatred for Jerry Krause is one of the biggest driving forces of his career. It's insane. Like we've seen it so many different places in, in this, in these documentaries so far, we saw at the end with Dan Marley, he said, uh, Jerry Krause thought Dan Marley was a good defensive player. I'm going to show him he's not. He, he, the same thing with Kukoc, um, you know, him thinking that he loves this new child more than his current children. Like there's just so much of that recurring hatred for Jerry Krause, um, just manufacturing that competition, that, that, that drive, that, that, that fuels him. So, it, so if Jerry Krause, this is my, one of my biggest problems with him, unfortunately, with him, unfortunately not being alive to participate in this documentary for a variety of reasons, but the main of which he would have gone into this with the mindset of, yeah, I pissed them off on purpose. Do you see how good I got them to play? Like he could have said that. And that would have, he would have 100% that on the camera and been able to defend himself. But because this is Michael Jordan with a final cut to this whole documentary, they continue to shine him in this light that it was his fault that everything fell apart. No, it, it was his fault that he pissed you off to dominate for 15 straight years. If he was just giving you whatever you wanted, you may not have actually been Michael Jordan for all we know. And also, quick note, you know at the bottom of the screen when they do gambling commercials and it says, do you have a gambling problem? Call this number. Because of Jordan's quote tonight, I don't have a gambling problem. I have a competition problem. Are they going to have to add another clause that says, have a gambling problem? Have a competition problem? Question mark. Call this number because that's an epic quote. I I actually thought, go ahead. I want to sit on some Gamblers Anonymous meetings in the future. Uh, Hi, my name is Justin Fan. I have a competition problem. (laughs) Well, look, that, that to me, that is the crux of the two episodes is Jordan coming out. And, and, you know, we, we talk a lot about the fact that he does have sort of final say in what this looks like. Um, nothing about the gambling elements of it made him look very good. And saying that I have the competition problem is as much about denial as it is anything else. The fact that you can lose so much money 
does not mean that you don't have the gambling problem. Like when he is in the locker room tossing, you know, dimes with the security guards and like the comp- the level of competition, the ferocity that he brings to that, to me, was the same as talking about what he was doing on the golf course. And what I loved about it even more is he has no shame about it. Like every single controversy in his career that drove him away was about how gambling was perceived and how he was connected to it. And even then, he does not, he stop. He never stops gambling at all. Matt Moore, you're giving me a look. Yeah, so I, I disagree with the idea that it's, like, I think he's honest in that he has a competition problem. Like, it's funny, but this is the thing is, the story, there's a bunch of the stories in the piece that I wrote you can find on Action Network that really kind of detail this. But the one that I think that sticks out to me more than anything, um, well, there's two. One, he cheated in the game of crazy eights with a college teammate's mother. Like his college teammate's mother was at the table and he felt like he had to cheat. He had an eight under his leg. And the other one is a good friend of his that he met in North Carolina. His friend was just putting into a cup in the hallway of the dorm. And Jordan passes says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to get, I'm just putting into this cup. And he says, let me give it a try. And he says, I'll bet you 75 cents. I'll bet you a quarter. I'll bet you a quarter. I can, I can make more out of 10 than you. And they go back and forth. And the guy's like, Michael, I, I have class. And Jordan's like, no, no, come back here because he lost. And it, it, all of the stuff reinforces the Esquina stuff, like all of it reinforces this idea, which is like, Jordan frames it as I'm competitive. I have to win. It's not that. It's I have to beat you. And like, he says that when he talks about the blackjack game, like when they're talking about that black, I forget who it was. Will Purdue. When Purdue's like, yeah, he came to the front of the play and we were playing $1 blackjack. And I was like, Michael, why are you playing in this? And he's like, cause I want your money in my pocket. Like it wasn't about the dollar and it wasn't about blackjack. It was, I have to beat you and you is everyone. And like that to me is his compulsion is like, he was, and, the, and that's how it ties into what Justin was talking about. Like everything was personal and you find out, like, think about the context of what we're talking about here. He's playing against Ku coach. He's playing to redeem America's honor and win a gold medal. That's not enough. I have to have the motivation of destroying a 19 year old that this executive likes that I have no respect for anyway, or I'm going to destroy Dan Marley to win my third NBA title and lift myself in the conversation as the greatest player of all time. Nope. Because the guy that I think is a fat loser thought this guy was good. Like that to me is where we start to get into where Michael Jordan psychosis goes off the rails. And yet it's the, almost the entire reason that he is the most celebrated athlete in history. Yeah. Or taking offense to being compared to Clyde Drexler personally, you know, um, before, before we toss it to Wab, I wanted to to uh, to add this this quick little bit that this false false equivalency that we saw from from Jordan that because he wasn't broke because his wife hadn't divorced him because his his kids weren't starving that he wasn't that he didn't have a gambling problem he's like hey I still have money I haven't sold off all my things yet my wife hasn't divorced me my kids still eat I'm not a gambling addict it's fine it's totally fine so the primal instinct that the way the way Michael Jordan's brain is wired, the primal instinct that goes through to everyone always says, I'm a competitive guy. I only like winning. I hate losing. This was on a different level. And the only comparison I can think of is I have a beagle in this house and beagles are notoriously very hard headed. They want to be alphas regardless of the animal or whatever dog is around. My beagle specifically will go onto couches and clothes that the cat has been on. It will sit on it and rub its stink all over the clothes just to say, I now... This dog is saying, I now own this mountain of clothes. And the reason why I'm telling you this is by Jordan just getting up out of his seat to go play $1 blackjack, That's there's no other purpose for doing that other than fulfilling his lust for dominance. And that's it. He wants to just be alpha at all times, even to his own teammates. And no cameras on or nothing. Some, some people usually sleep. Some people usually eat. Some people maybe read a book. What keeps Michael Jordan awake during the day and motivated is just being dominant and being an alpha. And we saw that in the locker room with the Smith brothers when they're pinching quarters over there, throwing quarters against the wall. Can we get a breakdown? There's an idea for an Action Network post, by the way. Can we go back into that footage 
and break down what exactly they bet on the run back. Because the second time that they played, I think Jordan gave away like four to one odds or something or gave four chances to one. What was the breakdown of the odds in that? Because it sure felt like Jordan just felt like losing money. And he felt like losing money because he knew it would piss him off to go play a basketball game. And God bless whoever had to guard him that night, probably at 55 dropped on him. But he gave away just insane odds just to get the rush of gambling, which is almost dangerous for people, right, that don't have the money to support that type of mentality. But Jordan obviously did. The fact that he was able to maintain that for decades is just like, at some point, dude, you got to stop. So that's really interesting because Jordan as a player was someone who I always felt when I was watching him, I thought he, I thought there was joy when I watched him, right? And maybe I just didn't see it because now when I watch him, I have an entirely different, when I watch these highlights and see this, I have an entirely different perspective on how he played, which was really, really freaking angry. And like with a fuel and a fire, which I always knew he was about competition above all else and about winning above all else. But I always thought that came from something internal and about wanting to be better than anybody else, not needing the made up. I'm, I was pissed about Barkley. I was pissed about Drexler. I was pissed about Marley. I was pissed about Kukoc. Like all those things feel like something that are made up in order to get him to feel better. Like I see him playing with rage now. I don't see him playing with joy. That's not what I, I that it's completely turned my perspective on him. This is, this is why Jerry Krause is genius. I don't even know if he meant to do it intentionally. Maybe it's for the best that he didn't because Jordan and Pippen would have picked up on the fact that he's just trying to piss us off. And now that's pissing us off. But because he had this just, I'm always mad. Like Jerry Krause put him in that position to always be mad. That's why his legacy should be different than what we're seeing in this documentary. Because whether it was intentional or not, he did exactly what you had to do to extract the maximum potential out of Michael Jordan, both physically and mentally. Yes, I, I don't even want to say it outright, but Jordan needed needed Jerry Krause to 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 reach his maximum potential. I, I want to just put it out there. I mean, we talked about this before in the construction of the roster, trading for Pippen, you know, getting all the supporting pieces um, necessary, and then fueling him, you know, on a day to day, on a game to game basis too. I mean, he was the the villain that Jordan needed to keep his his you know internal fire and competitive competitiveness go like going like that same instinct the same killer instinct that we just talked about for five minutes you have to keep that going for two decades somehow and jerry Krause just had the keys he had the way to keep poking the bear man i have a hot take I have let's a hot hear take. it lebron james's jerry Krause was dan gilbert but you can't ever beat the owner which is why he left to a lesser extent yes but not to that level. Like Jerry Krauss was all time. Like he but yeah, LeBron's different though. Like LeBron's like geared differently. Not to dip into a LeBron combo, but like I think he is like geared differently. But like I, I think you're absolutely right in that like he needed those things, but he needed all of those slides. Like that was what drove him his entire career. One of the things that like all of this content has made me wonder, it's been brought up before, is the question of how much Jordan loved basketball. Like Chad talked about joy. Um, and that's one of the things that I think that you do need these motivations in order to get past it after you've already won. Like, I think especially going for the repeat and the three P you need those things. And we saw that a little bit with the warriors and we've seen that a little bit with other teams where if they're, if you've already won, once you win the one title, like you're certified, you're like the thing that players always say after they win a title, I've been in those locker rooms and the quote I always look for that I always want to hear. And I always do without be is, they can never take this away from me after they win the first title. That's what they all say. They can never, they can never take this away from me because athletes are always of the mindset that everyone's trying to tear them down, even as they're like celebrated and supported and all these things. And so I think that when you get to the repeat and especially the three peat level, that's where those things matter more. But with Jordan, it was like always on. It just was always on, even from like the eighties, he was always geared that way. Um, I, I'm actually kind of curious about like the level of vitriol that we pick up on for Kraus. It does seem to increase as the years go on. Am I, am I wrong in that? Like it never gets, there aren't like lesser times. It always seems like, no, no, no. He takes it a step higher every single season that we get into. 
Yeah, and then he just becomes like more wide open about it. He's he's. I mean, we get these little these little quips about you know not giving the cigar because uh, Mike it might stun his growth. Like he, it just becomes more and more open and just insults him publicly in front of his teammates. I feel like we're having a conversation right now where this is the moment where we're deciding Jerry Krause is the secret hero of this documentary. And at the end of the movie, Jerry Krause is going to be someone who the entire public feels is uh, underappreciated and beloved. And Michael Jordan, it turns out, was the evil mastermind and a horrible person the whole time. My question here is, do we really think Jerry Krause in 1984 recognized the passion, energy, and psychology of Michael Jordan and figured out, I am going to have to be this guy's foil. I am going to have to, when he breaks his foot, I'm going to control his minutes against his will. And that's going to fuel him to come out and score 63 against Larry Bird and turn into the greatest player in history. And then I am going to continue to be a guy who puts slights in front of him. So that makes him win more titles for me. I just don't see him having that much of a master strategy. I see him being a guy who they all hated because he was short. He was fat. He was aggressive in terms of how he talked about the organization before them. And he, they didn't feel like he treated him very well. I wouldn't go as far to say as, he was thinking that before the draft, but maybe I'll give you a little credit in terms of maybe he saw that in 1984 during his rookie season. I wasn't he close to like holding the scoring title that season or something. I, whatever he did, he probably recognized something, got the competitive juices flowing. And then when he wanted to come back that following year after his injury and he was threatening coaches, I'm going back out there despite my 14 minute limit. Like, I'm going out there. I don't care if I get you fired. He probably recognized and heard all of this was happening. So in a very quick amount of time, during the, they showed us that Pacer game in, in the second episode of the documentary, I think, when he's telling him, I'm going back out there. And the coach goes, if you go back out there, I get fired, just so you know that. They have, like, a very strict time limit on you. And I'm sure that went up to Kraus at some point. He goes, ooh, well, I'm going to use this against him. Yeah, I'll, I could totally hear an argument about that, but – I think it wasn't until we saw that actually play out in a professional atmosphere versus at Carolina or coming up getting cut from the, the high school team. I mean, kids get cut from the high school team all the time and they use that as motivation. So um, Jerry Krause clearly saw something and whether it was on purpose or not, him pissing Jordan off was a big part of the Bulls dynasty. And you just put a period on that. There is no arguing it. See, I, I think I, my perception is is more that I think – um, it's a happy accident. I also think that Jordan would have found someone to be the target of his vitriol. I think he would have found someone to hate. And I think Krauss fit nicely because of his attitude. Um, and like, look, uh, this conversation, if we're going to be real, is it's not new. Like, or it hasn't died. Like, players hate the idea of guys that didn't play thinking they know more than them, the best players in the world. No matter how many former athletes go into management rakes and have issues doing the job, they'll always feel that those guys understand the game better. And there are guys that have done it and done it extremely well. So like it's a mixed bag of history. It's more about like, what are your skills? And Krauss was bad with people and he was bad with PR and he was bad with politics, but he was really good at scouting. He was great at scouting. He was good at talent evaluation. And he was good acting as basically Reisendorf's henchman to get the deals that he wanted done to keep that team way cheaper than it probably should have been. Um, I don't think that Krauss is a hero in this story. I think that he's a victim in this story. And those two things are very different because I think that Krauss is getting maligned in a longstanding and important historical document without the ability to defend himself. But I also do not think that he bears as much responsibility. Like when he talks about like everyone, this organization, everyone that does this, like, look, great organizations support great players to win titles. That's how it works. Like great organizations provide the opportunity for great players to win. That's what great organizations do. They are not the driving force for winning. And like that clip that they showed tonight of Krauss talking about it, like that was 
obtuse and that was ridiculous and it was absurd. You have my Matt, did it remind you of some Joe Lacob talk loosely? <laughs> yeah. The scene that um this will be our last point for the night. The scene that I will take away, and it, it circles back to a little bit of what I said earlier. Like to me, Michael Jordan was the ultimate competitor, and I reveled in sort of the way other players looked like they were afraid to play against him. And there is that scene when the Knicks Bull series is happening and he and Starks get into a scrum and he needs to be held back. And the way his face looks when he is about to go after Starks, it used to mean to me like fierce competition, but now I look at it as a little bit with like rage and hate. And I'm not sure I like that very much in Michael Jordan. That, I think that's kind of just the definition and illustration of him. We haven't even touched on the damn politics of this episode, which was a major part of his career. And he, he's making it very clear that I do not want to be your role model. I, I don't. I want to be a basketball player. I enjoy competition. That's my motivations. That's who I want to be known as. And I think it's even like that still to this day. To get him to show up to a public appearance, get him to show up to Carolina to give a speech is once every decade and a half. Like he just doesn't want to do these things. That doesn't make it right or wrong. And on the at the same time, you criticizing that is not right or wrong either. If you're out there thinking Jordan should have been Muhammad Ali, that you're entitled to your opinion as much as the person next to you. But as for Michael Jordan, he made it very clear. I want to kill you if you're on the other team. I want to kill you if you're in the way of my competition mindset, bloodlust. Uh, I want to play basketball. I want to compete these are the only things that matter to me besides family i think he's made that very clear and at the end of the day that's what i think we should all remember michael as because he wants wants us to he doesn't want us to reshape his image this documentary is a vendetta for a image which i have been misconstrued for my entire life he's saying no this is exactly who i was please believe me i still want it this way that's it yeah, and I think that's why he included the stuff on Harvey Gantt, which was surprising to me that that, that that you know got a spotlight. And he said, I never thought of myself as an activist. I thought of myself as a basketball player. Was that selfish? Probably. Um, that was his quote. And, you know, I, I thought that it left a little bit to, to be desired, honestly, because he had like a couple of decades to come up with some sort of explanation of what, of why he did what he did. But at the same time, to Wob's point, it is who he is, and he's not running away from it. He openly acknowledges it, and and you know is doubling down on it. You know, uh, you know, decades later. I thought it was really well done, actually. I thought that that section was good because it was critical. It can it included critical voices. Um, it gave it, it gave the African American uh, political perspective at the time um, from like respective voices. There, I thought that was like I thought that was really well done. Um, something that stood out to me when, when Wob was talking, is just like, I started thinking about Pippen. will talk about like us and our team and who we were. And Phil always does the same. And I kind of realized like every single segment on Jordan is about me. I, it's about like my life. Like even the, the behind the scenes stuff is very like self-driven. Like, well, I got to do this or I got to do this, or I'm going to do this. Um, it's all very, it's extremely, it's extremely self-centric um like self-centered is the word but it's more of just like there are people that try and and have a view that encapsulates the entirety that has some perspective uh beyond their own view and this documentary very much illustrates how everything in michael jordan's world is entirely about him like the whole world at one point revolved around jordan the entire world did and it feels like he has spent his entire life feeling that way in a way that is, um, I don't know if it's refreshing. I would not say that it's just very stark how he perceives things and how he perceives even sport and the game of basketball through that lens. Well, look, next week is episode, episode seven. Everyone has said episode seven is the episode where we're going to learn why Michael Jordan is so nervous. Everybody is going to hate him after that episode. Uh, it's certainly been eye-opening. Like this, this, that episode six tonight for me 
And I think, Wob, you cap you encapsulated it really well. Like, this is who he wants to be. And we were all reflecting who we wanted him to be through all the commercials, through the basketball, through the acrobatics, through the way he competed. And we took joy in the competition when in reality for him, the competition was fierce, it was angry, and he was never going to be anything other than that. We're only now figuring out what those things are and marrying it to Michael Jordan after playing and Michael Jordan when he was playing. So now I can't wait to see episode seven. It's going to have a lot to do with gambling. It's going to have to do a lot with the baseball. It's going to have a lot to do with his father. I'll tell you that much. Here's a little tease for you. I like it. Well, I like all those things. All right, fellas, Matt Moore, Justin Fan, Rob Perez, Worldwide Wob. Another great episode. We'll talk to you guys again next week after seven and eight.